everyone, I'm Karen Pashby, and my contribution to the Critical Internationalization Masterclass is a talk about critical global citizenship education, um, how we've identified it, what are its possibilities, what are its limitations, how can we nuance our understanding of it. Um, and I draw heavily in this talk on two papers, so you know I would direct you to those um, for kind of a deeper deeper analysis than what I'm able to offer in this talk. Um, and they are co-authored by um, dear colleague and respected colleagues of mine, Marta da Costa, Sharon Stein, and Vanessa Andriotti. So many of the ideas I'm presenting here are, are, are theirs. So I've been working with the idea of global citizenship education for almost 20 years now. It's kind of a long time. Um, at first, it was kind of a peripheral idea, and I first heard about it um, when asked to um, contribute to a, um, a committee that was to establish a mission statement for an international school I was teaching at in Brazil. Um, and it was so interesting to me that that conversation sparked some of the most interesting discussions I'd had at that school about um, our own um, desire to, do, to see a different type of world, but also our complicity within it. Um, and so it's a real aspirational idea to me. I think that's what keeps drawing me back to it. This idea that we could be global citizens, that we could share rights and responsibility across the world and um, beyond and perhaps despite uh, nation states. And I think in terms of education, it's focus on teaching um, you know, people of all ages about our interdependency with others in the world is, is really um, exciting. But it can mean so many different things, and it can be an umbrella term for so many different things um, that I think it's sometimes um, kind of means nothing. Um, and so as Greg Mannion and his colleagues have noted, it can be like this floating signifier that just gets covered up by different meanings. And, um, you know, it exists in this nexus of, of overlapping and sometimes um, contradictory intentions. And um, Lynette Schultz and Tashika Pillay have pointed out that global citizenship literature and theorizing often represents the continu uh, con continuing dominance of Western discourses that do little to challenge the citizenship or educational needs of those who need it the most. And all of this um, kind of possibility, but also contestation around global citizenship education has been heightened because where it was a bit of a peripheral concept there for a while at the turn of the 21st century, um, it's now um, receiving a lot of attention, having been included in the sustainable development goals and particularly target 4.7. So um, Marta and Vanessa and Sharon and I um, started thinking about a way we could respond to the kind of proliferation of different approaches to global citizenship education that were being accounted for in um, a whole bunch of articles um, that sought to identify and describe um, the different types of global citizenship education. And so um, we looked at these nine in particular, sorry, so we looked at these um, nine um, typologies and we did select only nine and there are more and you can look at the paper uh, for more information about why we selected these. But we thought it'd be very interesting to compare and contrast the different ways that they are um, looking at global citizenship education. So a key aim of um, the paper that we wrote was to consider how these existing typologies reify possibly or challenge dominant ways of thinking about global citizenship education and to possibly offer a framework for identifying both possibilities for alternative approaches but also kind of foreclosures of those approaches if we pivot back into the kind of um, ways of um, doing global citizenship education that we've inherited. So in terms of methodology, we drew on social cartography. So we were situating ourselves as mappers of the field. Um, we wanted to identify some patterns without tr with trying not to just diminish them into new categories exactly. Um, and we were informed by our own work. So we weren't totally um, 
objective um, observers in that sense. We're not pretending that's what we were doing. Um, and really importantly, we really want to honor this like incredible amount of work that um, our colleagues have done in global citizenship education to map out different types of global citizenship education and the breadth and depth um, that the typologies represent. At the same time, we were motivated to try and move what can feel like to us at times circular conversations about the theory and practice of global citizenship education into new directions that might be more responsive to our pressing challenges today. So we used the author's descriptions and analyses as well as our own interpretations um, to map and I'll talk about our heuristic in a moment. And you're going to see our ma mapping, and I'm going to talk about it a lot and actually make some claims about it. <laughs> um, so it appears as quite fixed, but it's better to understand it as one capturing of a mapping. It continues to be discussed, and as we presented it at conferences, we moved it and um, changed it. And the capturing you see is the one we ended up publishing, but we continue to use it to reflect on our own research and teaching. And um, I think that's an important aspect of the way we approach social cartography. So we drew on the heuristic from the Ethical Internationalization Higher Education Project, um, which involved over 20 uh, project partners from around the world who together um, determined that um, and through a literature review that there were kind of three main discursive orientations framing um, at, in this particular, that particular study, how universities were responding to globalization and education through internationalization policy and practices. And those three main discursive orientations were neoliberal, liberal, and critical. And it's really important um, to note that we saw this heuristic of these, these, the heuristic of the three discursive, inter um, discursive orientations as sitting on top of an intersection of a corporate imaginary and civic imaginary in a particular historical context uh, in the early 21st century. And um, that also exists within a dynamic and contested but enduring modern colonial and global imaginary. And I would direct you to um, that article, um, Andriotti, Stein, Pashby, and Nicholson, to, um, 2016, for kind of further information about the theoretical grounding there. But when we got together with our project partners, we definitely um, recognized those three main discursive orientations. But when we started to actually talk about practices and policies um, and the types of signifiers being used um, in internationalization in higher education, we realized they often didn't quite neatly map into a single discursive orientation, but actually often deployed um, with multiple, even contested and sometimes overlapping um, meanings. So that's where we added the heuristic, uh, sorry, the interfaces to the heuristic. Um, and I'm going to just explain one example. This is from an article um, that I wrote with Yanni Hapakoski, who did his PhD um, as related to the Ethical Internationalization and Higher Education Project. And this is a mapping we did of um, internationalization policies in um, a selection of universities in Europe. And we were looking specifically at this agenda around diversifying the international student population. Um, and I just want to point out here the neoliberal critical interface. So we noticed um, a push across these universities to kind of target the type of diversity that they wanted in their international students. And so from a neoliberal perspective, this um, arose through discourses around um, particular types of domestic students, um, particular types of domestic students who would then need an international experience, perhaps, or benefit from having an international student population, but more so from uh, a focus on recruiting international students from emerging economies um, and these emerging nations that could then give um, that particular nation state an advantage moving forward because they would have relationships to these students who would go back home and that would help um, you know, that nation to be competitive on the global market. So this is around leveraging the international message for um for economic capital, but also um, as a kind of branding exercise. Then we noticed that actually you could take target 
targeted diversity from a critical perspective and have it focus on um, recruiting um, students from historically marginalized um, communities, for example, and in put, and, and including their um, knowledges and kind of um, that could be an interesting strategic move. At the same time, that could also be problematic and could pivot us as sort of back into the problems we're trying to solve. So this is an example of how the interfaces can um, show us kind of strategic spaces of ambivalence, but also problematic spaces as well. And the fact, the reason that that point about historically marginalized students and knowledges is in um, italics is we didn't actually find it in the um, European policies. Uh, it was mentioned in one of the North American ones, but we can also identify absences using this heuristic, which is kind of an interesting um, aspect of the methodology, which you'll see um, when I get back to the typologies of global citizenship education. So basically we took the types as they were described by the um, authors. So by types mean the subsets that they identified and we sort of compared and contrasted them and looked at in what ways their descriptions and analyses of different types of global citizenship educations mapped onto our heuristic. Um, but we did identify a couple of new interfaces. So again, um, social cartography can be an iterative um, um, methodology in that sense. So we use the heuristic, but we're not limited by it in that way. Um, so here's the capturing of the mapping that we did that was um, published in the article. And then um, we do make some claims or some observations based on the cap that particular capturing of the um, mapping that we agreed to discuss together and kind of settled on in a way you could say. So one of the findings is that there's a, an alignment, a confluence of um, types of global citizenship education being defined as neoliberal. I mean, pretty much everybody identifies them in the same way. The language or the terminology is slightly different, but there's a consensus that there's a very strong type of neoliberal global citizenship education, and it's consistently critiqued across the typologies. The liberal discursive orientation sees the most quantity and differentiation of types. The critical, um, sometimes it's called critical and it's actually represents a whole bunch of a conflation of, of actually distinct types of global citizenship education we found. Um, and then where there are some distinctions or where there is anything being called critical, it most often maps onto an interface with the liberal configuration. Um, definitely, we found the interface is very useful, particularly neoliberal liberal and liberal critical. In fact, we decided to distinguish liberal critical and critical liberal, which I'll talk about in a moment. And we identified two new interfaces, neoliberal liberal, neoconservative, and critical post-critical. Overall, um, our mapping kind of found that despite the considerable diversity of global citizenship orientations, we tend to um, have typologies that remain largely framed by a limited range of possibilities. There's so much um, distinction within liberal approaches um, that we worry that our conversations might be closed off from imagining viable alternatives. And so all the attention to distinguishing within the liberal um, kind of uh, reasserts a liberal orientation. And it could be that this is strategic in the face of, uh, you know, this onslaught of neoliberalism. Um, but it does help us to realize the, the lack of nuance, the tension to the critical outside of a liberal critical interface. And the critical is often seen in... Um, across the, the typologies and some of them, sorry, a number of them, I should say, as idealistic and not really evident in practice. The neoconservative liberal, uh, neoliberal liberal interface, we think is particularly important um, when we see all these types of um, liberal global citizenship education, because then they interface into it. And it could be a response uh, to this criticism that 
critical approaches are idealistic, that they're morally relativistic, that they um, kind of seek to control people into like a new ideology, um, and that this could forestall the liberal values of open dialogue and debate and individual choice. So it's possible that we see that concern then to pay attention to the liberal as as kind of um, a more safe space. But it also can uh, interface quite strongly with this neoliberal, neoconservative interface or with the discursive orientations. Um, and we also find that um, that critical global citizenship education actually is itself uh, has its has its is in need of some nuanced attention, but it tends to just be um, identified as one thing: critical global citizenship education, um, and that that's a conflation, um, and that often occurs where it's being critiqued. So. Overall, we found that while such responses to critical approaches tend to ignore or frame and reverse the uneven distribution of power that characterizes not only global relations, but also purportedly neutral dialogues between different ideas, if the basis of action and collaboration in global citizenship education is perceived to be consensus about a shared idea or set of values, the conversations about different orientations can quickly become contests over the position of epistemological hegemony, contests whose outcomes will likely be determined by pre-existing relations of power. So I really want to emphasize that the purpose of mapping all of these distinctions onto our heuristic was not to kind of just point out and say, ooh, that's so bad, the liberal approaches or whatever. Um, it's not about throwing out any of these approaches. It's about recognizing they're all evident in policy and practice and in scholarship, and there's attention. Um, and it's not about presenting the critical approach as the new hegemony. Um, in fact, it also requires critical engagement. But it's about really being honest with ourselves about the types of conversations we're having and the types of possibilities that they're opening up or foreclosing. So um, Marta and I were interested in taking some time um, and doing a bit of a deeper dive into that right-hand corner around critical global citizenship education, because obviously in the first paper, there's only so much you can do in, you know, 8,000 words. So what we found when we spent a little bit more time um, looking at the results of our typology mapping or at the capturing um, of the mapping was that some of the typologies name and critique a clear liberal critical interface. So for example, um, in Vanessa's 2014 type, um, typology, she talks about um, critical humanist. And that is, you know, this idea of expanding human progress to include the rights of those historically marginalized rather than substantively challenging the status quo, nor the modern colonial imaginary. And it's for that reason that we have identified some of um, the types of global citizenship education and the typologies in the liberal critical interface. Others, um, like Godelli and Schultz, identify a specific type of global citizenship education as Marxist or radical, uh, that share a clear concern with inequality within the status quo and kind of push really strongly the quest questions around the political economy of global citizenship education. Um, so we thought those were very interesting to note. Um, and in her analysis of, of radical global citizenship education, Schultz points out that it one problem with it is that it can focus so closely on how structures determine the conditions of of the world, that it limits space to imagine authentic change or relationships for develop, from developing, which is why we've put it in the critical liberal corner. And um, the other thing we kind of point out in this article that I think is really useful is um, Sharon Stein's distinction between the anti-oppressive an incommensurable position on global citizenship education. So the anti-oppressive position, similarly in a way to the radical and um, Marxist um, types that were identified by Godelli and Schultz, 
um, is interested in social justice and can even like include quite a strong critique of westernization or eurocentrism but there's also an inadvertent assertion of innocence in kind of a lack of recognition of the complicity in the systems being critiqued. And there can be kind of a pivoting back into um, a status quo approach or using the same structures to try and get out of a structural problem or just create a new structure that um, doesn't significantly challenge the modern colonial imaginary. On the other hand, the incommensurable position um, in that position, existing script, scripts for thought and action, um, including those, you know, in a liberal interface, are not outright rejected, but their limitations are illuminated through encounters with and across difference. So it shares with the anti-oppressive position, this critical global citizenship idea of recognizing oppression and symbolic and material violence um, in often in the very ways we talk about global citizenship but the difference is that it presents a possibility of engaging differently with the existing order ordering of the world and in the article we, th we see a parallel there um, and we feel like Sharon's distinction extends the distinction that Lynette Schultz made between radical and transformational global citizenship education and it draws on possibilities offered by relationships across difference that don't need to be reconciled through consensus or synthesis. And uh, it's very important to note the kind of decolonial theory that um, Sharon is drawing on there and that distinction. And, and I would really encourage you to go and, and read through that article. So back to the original article, um, after we sort of summarized our observations um, reflexive observations from our own mapping. We offer an additional layer of analysis to try and support conversations to move beyond these circular discussions. Um, and we um, distinguish between three levels of analysis, the first being methodological or way of doing, and many um, approaches to global citizenship education um, are concerned with this particular level of analysis. Um, and sometimes understandably, I mean, you have to make a policy or you have to actually do something within the current context. Um, it's important, you know, think about what we're going to do and to make some decisions. Um, at the same time, just leaving the conversations there is quite limited. Um, and we are noting an increase in approaches that intervene at the epistemological level, challenging normalized assumptions and power relations and pr proposing historical and systemic analyses. But we also note that there's, it's important to add a third level of analysis and that questions we could ask from the ontological standpoint um, are important, but they may not be legible within the over-socialized modern ontology. And um, I'm giving a little gesture here to another article um, that Sharon and Vanessa have been involved in that um, talk about these three levels of analysis as like the, the olive tree, where the methodological questions are like the flowers or the leaves. The epistemological layers of analysis are the branches. And the ontological refers to sort of the trunk, the way of being. Um, and it's so important to consider those. Um, and But because we're so socialized in the, in the modern ontology and we're existing within um, modern structures, it's very difficult to, and, and it's for that reason that, it, you know, they can be incommensurable with education and formal education in particular. And, and they've been largely absent also from global citizenship conversations as a result. We haven't seen them or often haven't even been aware um, that we're not talking about them. And um, although it might be very difficult um, to kind of find ontological interventions in global citizenship education, we argue that we could be supporting learners to sit at the edge of the modern ontology. This could be quite productive pedagogically. Um, but it will be difficult to identify, let alone work through and be taught by these limits if our engagements with global citizenship education ask only methodological and epistemological questions and do not engage in ontological questions. And in that paper, the 2000, or 2020 paper, um, we offer quite a, a, a substantive amount of different questions at different levels that um, we, we suggest we could be considering in global citizenship education.
So back to the paper with Marta and I, where we did a bit of a deep dive into this bottom right hand corner. Um, we realized that those of us working in critical global citizenship education face pretty significant tensions and critiques on two sides. On the one side, um, critical approaches can be seen as idealistic, not actually existing in practice or relevant to practice, that they're just about moral relativism, and they lead to a paralysis, uh, guilt, and lack of action. Um, on the other hand, um, we can also see that where critical approaches kind of engage just at an epistemological layer of event, um, intervention, um, it can get caught into a circularity of reproduction of the modern colonial imaginary and its attempt to kind of critique the systems from within the systems and produce new systems without really taking seriously our complicity within those systems themselves and the limits of the modern colonial imaginary. And so that's um, second the first one is kind of the critique coming from the liberal neoliberal interface. And the second critique is coming from kind of the post-critical interface. And so we decided to take a look at um, the literature, empirical literature that is actually building um, around critical approaches to global citizenship education. And specifically, we work, looked at um, coming out of global north context. And I really should have said this at the beginning. The typologies we looked at are written in English and largely from and about global north context. So they're already <laughs> extremely limited in their own way. Um, but we're just trying to contribute to the conversations that we're having as a field in, in that limited space. And likewise, the empirical research that we were able to find on critical approaches to global citizenship education are largely from global north context as well. So we decided to kind of limit it to that, to compare it uh, like to like in a way. That's also a limitation for sure. But what we found in, in that review of empirical research, um, taking a, a critical global citizenship education approach, is that definitely at the methodological level, formal education, um, global citizenship education is caught in um, a liberal, neoliberal interface and arguably with the competencies discourse as well into a neoconservative um, interface. At the same time, uh, the empirical research shows that there is a healthy application uh, of critical framings to en engage in epistemological levels of analyses, and even some interventions at that level are evident. In terms of the ontological level, the empirical research that we looked at at secondary schools in Global North contexts um, you know, there's some gestures there and there's definitely some important questions from the ontological level that are being raised pedagogically, um, but more at a level of analysis and probably not surprisingly at the level of intervention. So we found that critical engagements with global citizenship education in empirical research are framed, at least the what we looked at, the limited research we looked at, are framed primarily through a methodological approach and retain an assumption of linear progress, where more knowledge and training can lead to identifiable solutions and actions. But centering epistemological concerns by complexifying conversations and engaging approaches that begin to question um, our ontological basis in the modern colonial imaginary those less invested in certainties and answers do have the potential to foster wider conversations about what global citizenship education can be in practice. And of course, these are constrained by the context of formal education structures. I mean, nothing more modern and uh, colonial in a, in a sense than formal education. But at the same time, Marta and I argue that it's so important to look at the possibilities and the important innovations that are coming um, and happening in that area. So a couple things to just finish off the discussion. Um, in the original, in the paper in 2020, the typologies of typologies, we do say that, you know, to offer prescriptive alternative approach to global citizenship education inspired by decolonial critiques would betray what we read as the spirit of the critique itself and its recognition of the difficulty of approaches to change that do not create more of the same. So we're not proposing that the limits of the modern colonial imaginary is the only place, you know, from which to continue further conversations about global citizenship education. Rather, we're inviting engagements 
with what these limits might teach us about the enduring colonial systems that have kept this imaginary in place. It may be that only once we've understood the difficulty and even the impossibility of transcending this imaginary that something different can become possible. And as a final thought, um, in the paper with Marta, we end um, by um, raising this. Critical global citizenship education approaches have opened important conversations in formal education contexts while continuing to risk reinforcing Western binaries, as evident empirical research, including our own. We therefore end with a question that emerged from our meta-review of GC typologies and direct it specifically to those of us working within critical global citizenship education and formal education contexts, and we are working in the Global North context. How might we use critical global citizenship education in strategic ways while remaining conscious of its significant limitations, potential harms, and the partiality of any particular approach? So on the one hand, our typology showed that there's a really healthy amount of work going on in global citizenship education, and we are making some really important nuanced distinctions, but it also suggested that we um, are spending a lot of time distinguishing between liberal approaches. Again, that could be strategic in face of neoliberal, neoconservative dominant um, discourses that are emerging. But we certainly see some development in the critical side. It's not just idealistic and morally relativistic. Um, and there are examples increasingly in practice. So it's really important that we spend as much attention and time on that area and that we challenge ourselves to critique that work as well and to push for an increasing reflexivity across the board um, so that we can seek to actually significantly challenge and change our ways of relating rather than package them up in new ways. Um, so thanks so much for listening to this talk um, and uh, I look forward to hearing any feedback. Thanks a lot.